Few sagas have captivated Australia and the Australian media as much as the Bali Nine. But we only know some of those nine stories. Three Australians are sentenced to be killed, shot, and yet we have barely even heard the voices, let alone the stories, of two of them. Tonight, Myran Sukumaran and Andrew Chan speak at length for the first time about their crime, their lives and their impending death sentence. It's 8am, Kerabakan prison and morning roll call is about to begin. Kerabakan has been cast as a hellhole through books and media coverage about Chappelle Corby and others. It's a portrayal that rankles with the governor, Paxa Swanto. I saw that the media of Australia terhadap lembaga pemasyarakatan gerobokan itu sangat negatif. Itu tidak menggambarkan kondisi atau kenyataan pada saat sekarang ini. Jadi, given a chance to give me his view of his prison, the governor grants permission for Chan and Sukumaran to be interviewed and remarkably permission to film inside. Ya, berita-berita itu jadi jangan mengada-ada. And for the first time, access to the Supermax section, more commonly known as Death Row Tower. The tower was home to the Bali bombers before they were executed. How are you, mate? It's a prison within a prison, accommodating death row inmates and other foreigners, mostly serving life sentences. Fever. Bad one. Cell number two houses Myran Sukumara. Uh, you're not looking so good. Yeah, but I'm going to attempt to do a bit of sport today to sweat it out. His cellmate, fellow Bali Nine member, Si Yi Chin, and another man also held on drug charges. I never saw myself as like a bad person or something like that. As I look back at myself now, I see I was stupid back then, yeah, but I never thought of myself as a bad person. Morning. Good morning. How are you? Yeah, all right, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> Just got up. Yeah. Yeah. Next door is Andrew Chan, who shares this cell with three others. Hey, Dingo. You know, I never really was good at uh, hey, Dingo. being a, a family general man, really. You know, I hardly ever spent any time with my mum and dad, whatever, really, or my brothers and my sisters. Yeah, we didn't. We just didn't really get along. I, I just, I was pretty much like the black sheep of the family, to be honest. The prisoners are free to come and go from Supermax, but most of the day is spent here around a cell converted into a gym. It could be worse. It could be worse. So I suppose I'm thankful that every day I, I actually get to wake up. As you know, I'm studying and um, you know, a lot of people might see that and say, oh, you know, there's probably no use towards it. Uh, look where you're staying, but you know, I believe if you want to try and build yourself up to something, you know, you got to start somewhere. You got to start today and, you know, maybe tomorrow won't exist. All of the male members of the Bali Nine are imprisoned here but not all wish to be filmed. Most of them have had enough of that, including Scott Rush. You have been the focus guy. It's, it's odd, like, you haven't had much attention. He's yeah. had heaps. And it's unfair. Uh, yeah, due to racism. <laughs> oh, you reckon? I think so. Dark skinned. I think it's because uh, they're easier to identify with. He's, he's the real Australian, you think, yeah, yeah the, the, the white boy. Yeah. Uh, that's interesting. <laughs> For better or worse, this yard is now home. If you want to see the garden, I made the whole garden. And Myran has done his best to soften the vista of concrete and barbed wire. Like before, it's like all this, like barbed wire. Can you see that? Yeah. It's like this is depressing to look at, yeah? Yeah. So then I asked if I can just put bamboo there to close it off. Maybe. To shield it, and they said yeah. okay? Yeah. yeah. I tried to put these flowers inside here. Yeah. They're really cheap, they're like 5,000. Yeah. Which is like not even a dollar. Yeah. And then to just cheer it up a bit, huh? Yeah. 
But there was no grass here. But then um, before I came here, there was another Indonesian prisoner who was in room uh, three. Yeah. yeah. He started to go out to the garden and start stealing <laughs> little square plots of um, grass, grass and then and chop it up. And then we planted a planted plant. Planted plant <laughs> <laughs> and you did the whole yard then? <laughs> yeah. Cool. You done this before? <coughs> Never. Yeah. And this tree I actually planted about three years ago. It was like little and now it's like big. I wonder how big it's going to be when we can get out of here. To give a bit of shade for... How, how big it'll be, you think? Yeah. <laughs> you'll, you'll, have, you'll cover the yard, maybe. <coughs> it can be tough on the inside, but in some ways, even tougher for the families on the other side of the wire. It's visiting hour, and Myran's mother, sister and brother Chintu are joining the throng at the gates. Uh, we're just lining up, uh, waiting for our number to be called so we can get in. And then you have a few, a few hours? Yeah, we usually get to about 11.30 and then we can come back in the afternoon about 1.30 to 3. Yeah. Andrew's brother Michael makes the journey on behalf of the Chan family. Yeah, uh, we only try, I try and get over at least once uh, every six months or so, uh, twice a year. And um, yeah, it's a bit hard with work and everything, but yeah. You've got to take time off work? And, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a bit hard, but you've got to do what you've got to do. All of their lives fell apart on April 17, 2005 the day that Andrew and Myron were due back from what was presumably a holiday in Bali. I remember it like yesterday. I was expecting him to come home and he didn't, uh, you know, he wasn't there and I was wondering why he's late. I thought his plane was delayed and uh, I was actually waiting for him outside and um, walking up and down just, you know, wondering why he hasn't come home yet. My mum was getting nervous and she was outside and I don't know, a, a bad feeling came over me, something didn't feel right and I just got up and I, I put on the news and I saw him on Channel 9 and I thought, oh God, and um, I started to shake, um, I, nothing was coming out of my mouth and my mum was outside and, and I quickly locked the door so that she couldn't come in. So after knocking and knocking and knocking, she came, opened the door and she was trying to tell me that she saw Mayu in the news and something happened in Bali, but she couldn't get the words out. Mayu, Bali, arrested, um, and then that was, after that, everything just kind of caved in, pretty much. Um, I felt a cold chill running down my body and I remember falling on the floor and I just couldn't believe that this this thing happened you know you don't think that you're gonna get uh, caught and a huge scandal like this is going to happen and yeah. this is something like you'd watch on TV, right? Yeah. Tell me the moment it became uh, real. Tell me the moment when it went went wrong. Yeah, I was in front of the the Malasti Hotel and saw a huge bunch of men coming towards me, not wearing uniform. They're like undercover or something, sort of like frozen. I was like, wow, how? What's happened? What's yeah, happened? That's that, you know, in your heart, though, you know, this is the this is the moment, presumably. Yeah, but it's, it took me like I think a day or something to actually realize that I was, you know, this is actually happening. I'm getting arrested. I'm, yeah. The day in Bali began with most of the group of Australians strapping packages of heroin around their bodies and heading to the airport, not knowing that the Australian Federal Police had tipped off the Indonesian authorities. They were walking into a well-set trap. I was, I was, I was confident. I was, I was just like, okay, right. Where, 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 where were you? Where were I was you? in the airport. At the airport? At the airport and yeah, I was confronted 
I was confronted by a few few gentlemen. Can't exactly remember how many, but, but you, yeah. re you realise at this point that something is going seriously wrong. At least, what are they? Saying? Well, yeah, yeah. Look, you know, they didn't they didn't mention anything. You know, I just went, look, mate, I had a flight to catch. If you got nothing on me, I ought to go home. See ya. They uh, they ended up uh, detaining me and. That's probably where, you know, some seriousness of it really probably has just sunk in. I'd actually finished work, uh, gone and done some grocery shoppings for dinner. And um, gotten a uh, phone call from uh, mum and she was hysterical. Left the groceries where they were and uh, pretty much drove straight home to mum and dad. Same thing as last night. Yeah, you know, I've learned to, to realise my brother, my umbrella's my own best friend. That's not his He'd always stick his nose in there, even though I turn around sometimes and go, it's none of your business. You know, I know that he only wanted wanted to look out for me. Yeah, he used to think he was a prick, but... <laughs> <laughs> but it's true, I mean, I did. I used to think he was... I, I envied him, but uh, <laughs> he knows that, because I told him. Oh, OK. And... Some people say, well, did you know? Well, personally, if I knew he'd, he, he was up to something like that, I, I'd probably, it'd probably be more satisfaction for me to probably strangle him myself to death than to go through this uh, pain and agony with him right now. And then, what did you say to your mum? She'd worked uh, particularly hard all her life. Um, she was one of them, you know, the breadwinner for your family. Yeah. She raised you, she worked, she educated you, yeah. she's proud of you. Yeah. What do you say to someone like uh, that when you're I in a situation? saying I'm sorry. I don't know what I can do actually to make it all better, but... Denpasar Airport, 2 a.m. Lawyers Julian McMahon and Joel Backwell arrive to prepare Chan and Sukumaran's final appeal. McMahon represents a group of Melbourne lawyers who took over the case pro bono in 2006 after Chan and Sukumaran had lost three appeals in a row. Uh, well, it's the end of the road, really. They had three, three court cases in 2006. They lost them all, sentenced to death each time. Uh, this is now the final appeal under Indonesian law uh, and if they lose this, the death penalty um, stands to be imposed unless the president intervenes. What that really means is uh, you get taken out of your cell uh, during the night, get taken out to a remote spot, uh, tied to a post, firing squad, shot. And we have to change the judge's mind and we have to change the president's mind. Um, if we fail in that, they'll die. How long have you been sick? It's two days before their hearing and McMahon briefs the men on what the proceedings will be. And then I expect to be at least one more day after that which will be the um, prosecution's response to the three days in October. They'll be admitting their guilt and for the first time have some freedom to discuss their crime. I don't think I was really going where in life and I don't think, uh, you know, I was, I was achieving too much, even though I had a stable job and all. Um, yeah, I just don't think I was, I was really heading anywhere, to be honest, like, you know, I abused drugs myself. I was a drug user, so, um, you know, I, I, I know what it feels like to, to be, you know, one of them, them junkies walking on the street, I guess. But did you consider, which you must have, but did you consider that you're in a country with the death penalty, though? I mean... Um, no, you don't think too much of that. I didn't anyway. But, you know, most people think, yeah, you would, but I didn't. It was... It, more or less for me, it was just a oh, quick, 
quick payday. That's it. Just think to yourself, quick payday. That's it. And nothing more, nothing less. You're importing this stuff. I mean, you're going to put this on the streets of Sydney and Melbourne, Brisbane. Yeah, oh, that I, I didn't know. That, like, I knew that we'll bring it in. Where it was going, I didn't know. And, yeah, I did have a, I did have a role in it, and I, I did some, some stupid things in my life. Um, just like every other person would do some silly things in their life. Maybe not as extreme as me, but, you know. Um, as I said, I mean, the only thing I can do is, is, is apologise on that. I mean... Uh, but what would someone, you know, someone's got a 16-year-old, 17-year-old kid yeah. that's uh, becoming a junkie right now, what sympathy will they have for you? I mean, what... what, what oh, they probably don't have any sympathy whatsoever for me. Um, you know, they probably just think I'm an, I'm an a-hole. You know, I was one of them guys that were bringing it in. I was one of them guys that were bringing it in and so forth. But, you know, the truth of the matter is, um, you know, I, I, I did commit a crime and, you know, right now I'm, I'm, I'm obviously paying I'm obviously paying the price for it. Um, and, you know, uh, there's nothing I could do or say um, that, could, that could change their heart or, or, or nothing I could do or say that could, that could change the position on, you know, what their son or their daughter is doing right now. So what else are you reading? You've got Dante and Milton. I've got Dante Two of the all-time greatest books. Yeah. Uh... I got a couple of books on chess strategy. The only problem is I don't know how to read those books on chess strategy. I'm very fond of both of them. They've both become you know, lovely guides. I like them. Uh, they're a pleasure to work for. You know, they're on death row and they're kids, really. <laughs> First you negotiate for this and now you've negotiated your own your computer rooms and art classes. <laughs> Well, this is, this is a really good book for you to read. It's sort of looking at American history from the point of view of the poor and the oppressed and the underprivileged and the Indians. I, I got through 20 pages of this, but the like, last few months I haven't been able to read properly. Yeah. But the amount of people they killed in this... Place. It's unbelievable, isn't it? Yeah. It's writing about uh, life for people who were doing it hard and the history of people who were... Uh, before depressed. this cell, before you came to Bali, what were the first steps that uh, brought you here? Well, basically, a friend of mine who I went to uni with asked me to come to a dinner. And he asked me if I wanted to join a gang. I sort of and I laughed at that, yeah. And then I was never involved in this in high school, yeah. And so, or, I was like, yeah, I'll just come to dinner. Sitting around dinner and they were talking about all this type of stuff and it was kind of funny to me But you know like they pay for dinner and for the nightclub afterwards and stuff like that. So it's like yeah So it's a sort of party and party and drug scene uh, going going on. Yeah, there's a, a Huge risk whether you recognize it or not. You must have felt there was a risk. What was the reward? Paycheck yeah. Easy paycheck what were your circumstances uh, before that? There's easier ways to make money than uh, risking your life. Yeah, thinking back there, it's like, because, uh, you know, like, it's just a lifestyle, like, all the people there were living, you know, like, you want to be like those people, get the girls like those people. And I was hoping to buy a car, hoping to start a business. These, those are sort of the things. You know, like, I, I didn't see, like, myself working in a mailroom for the next 50 years of my life. I thought, no, I can't do this. And, you know, you see all these people in, like, nightclubs with nice BMWs and nice Mercedes. And, you know, there's always chicks there. And, you know, they're always buying drinks for everybody. And you think, fuck, you know, how do, how do you do this on a mailroom salary, yeah? Yeah, so. You've been given a death sentence, but you were also dealing in death. You weren't, a, you weren't a drug user yourself, but the people that were going to receive these drugs, yeah. uh, their lives were probably going to be destroyed. Yeah. Did you think that at, at the time? Do you think it now? No. Uh, can, can I be a little bit more uh, clear? I've never actually sold 
uh, errand to uh, you know like a user like a, a junkie or somebody just asked me to pick up something and then bring it over here and then that's the end of my involvement yeah okay so you're arm's length but you're still in the middle yeah. you're, the, you're the key part of a deadly trade like like that's what i was trying to say is you know like you see stuff on the tv and stuff like that yeah you see stuff about junkies you see you know like how life is but you, you don't have any feeling you know like you it doesn't you don't know any junkies right since i've been here i know i know, I know how fucked up heroin is now yeah but before you think only like the drugs that i was like close to was like probably ecstasy marijuana and that's it mm. how you feeling? How you feeling? Shackled together, Miyuran Sukumaran and Michael Chugai said nothing as they arrived at Denpasar Court. You know, with this whole first court case and stuff, we, most of us, I don't think we took it seriously. I mean, the press were all there, everybody was joking, laughing, the police were laughing. It was like a big media spectacle and, yeah. And then uh, the joke uh, turned turned pretty sour, yeah, pretty quickly. Yeah. Andrew Chan was taken from the holding cell and entered the court with an air of inevitability. How did you rate your chances then? What did you think was going to happen? I don't know. We had a lawyer then. He said ten years maximum. I was just thinking ten years could live with that. <laughs> I thought myself, I could live with it. He sat impassively as the judge read out his lengthy verdict. Judgment it coming. increased from 10 to 15 and then from 15 to 20 and then from 20 it went from yeah, up and up and up and up and up. Demikian isi putusan bagi terdakwa. Oh, I could have yeah, picked up and started screaming and kicking but thought myself, I'm, if I'm going to do that, what am I achieving? Nothing. With the death penalty handed down, a clearly distressed Muran Sukumaran knew he almost certainly faced the same fate. Do you remember the moment when they, uh, they announced their intention to, to kill you? Yeah. Tell me. Um, yeah, it was pretty shocking, pretty confused. Um, there's a bunch of people who shouted out, like, in support of it, and I was like, fuck this. Anti-drugs people or something over there, and then they all started screaming and cheering when they handed out the death sentence. Well, it's a grim reality. There, there still would be people that would, would applaud your death. Yeah. How do you deal with that? Uh, I try to not to think about it. Uh, I get a lot of mail saying that uh, that I deserve the death sentence. That you know, yeah, a lot of stuff like that. From Australia. Yeah. Do you respond? No. Well, I can certainly say that it would be a mistake to shoot them. They were um, bloody idiots, and they deserve to be in jail for a long time. The question is, should they also deserve to be taken out and shot? Julian has asked that question before, and it was answered brutally in the case of Australian Van Nguyen, arrested with drugs in Singapore. Mrs Nguyen prayed in a chapel in the agonising time before her son was put to death. He was executed on the 2nd of December at 6am on 2005. He is completely rehabilitated, completely reformed, completely focused on doing what is good, and now they're going to kill him. Thank you. Thank you. For McMahon, it's sobering to say the least that Van Wyn's rehabilitation and good character didn't deliver a last minute reprieve. But the last time I saw him was the day before he died. And can, you, can you tell us of that? Well, I, you know, I was with him for a while. I'm not sure how I could summarise that meeting. You know, it was a. Um, it, we were very close, and we spoke about very private things. And, um, moving on. 
we've said it plenty of times before and we just have to say it again you just have to remain calm and focused you know don't get over excited don't get depressed whatever happens just be steady yeah um, it's the no evening before their final courtroom appearance chan and sukumaran will be making the most important speech they've ever made their last chance to plead for their lives if you go back to 2006 on the trial the first appeal and the appeal to the Supreme Court. Yeah. Uh, you had three losses in a row. Death sentence three times. So, just remain steady about it all. So good. I, I know you are, but um, I don't want you to get, you know, too optimistic. And so I grand don't, final. Like a grand final? Like a grand final. Denpasar District Court. The day has been set aside to hear the pleas of Chan and Sukumaran. In the night when you go to sleep, you know, the last thing in your mind before you fall asleep is, you know, when is my son going to come home? And as soon as I wake up in the morning, that's what I have, you know, that's what is in my mind. And it was hard for me to sort of go on on day to day, like cooking and shopping and doing housework. It's really hard. I really sort of miss him and I just want him back with the family. Just want to see the kids together. She worries a lot about us and you know, she keeps us close and yeah, it's been pretty hard on her. Yeah, I think sometimes she struggles to let us do things on our own because she always wants to keep us um, close to her. So, um. Sorry. The, the media was pretty much um, telling everyone who he was and they're so loud that whatever we said meant nothing. I feel like people, people have already um, judged Mayu and made a judgment about our family. My daughter was studying and she couldn't continue her studies. It was too much for her to handle, you know, she couldn't concentrate. And, um, you know, the children sort of um, didn't go out much and they still don't. We um, sort of uh, kept to ourselves. You'd be shooting two young men who are uh, genuinely sorry, who are teaching lots of other prisoners how to get a job when those other prisoners leave jail. You know, I ask rhetorically, why would you shoot them? Why would you shoot people like that? Uh, emotionally, it's been a big roller coaster ride, you know, from what did we do wrong as a family or, you know, what did mum and dad do wrong uh, bringing him up? Where did he detour? Saya memohon maaf kepada masyarakat Indonesia. Saya juga mohon maaf kepada keluarga saya dan saya menyadari bahwa perbuatan saya dulu telah mempermalukan dan menyiksa semua anggota keluarga saya. What would I do if it did happen? Um, most days, I just uh, I tend to just block it out. Jika saya diampunkan, saya berharap agar suatu hari saya tepat mempunyai keluarga sendiri dan bekerja. Sebagai pendeta agar saya tepat membimbing anak-anak muda, saya masa masih tepat banyak menyumbangkan selama sisa hidup saya. There will be no more words to be spoken in court by Chan and Sukmaran. All the talking now will be by their Indonesian counsel, Mulya Lubis one of the most prominent lawyers in Indonesia. That penalty is not 
a just sentence. No? Over three more days, he'll be arguing the finer points of constitutional law and hearing from other witnesses. Andrew and Myran's job is done. Before returning to prison, Andrew has a chance to catch up with his girlfriend Farah, who he met in Kerobakan. Was it uh, love at first sight? Mu yang cinta aku yang udah yang lihat aku yang jatuh yang cinta. Hati saya cuk 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 And then dia kasih cium saya ini. Eh, eh, eh. Oh, ah, ah. Iya, kamu kasih cium aku ini? Iya. Sudah, cukup. Welcome to Scott Ramsey's. Back at the prison, there's a cook-up going on in the cell of Bali Niner Matthew Norman, whose shared room also serves as the gym. What sauce are you going to make, though? Oh, barbecue, honey, mustard. Oh. You can kick and scream, and at the end of the day, you're still going to be here. So you might as well make the most of it. Just do what you can to pass the time. Hey, Scrappy. 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 <laughs> Head cold. Go. So we will have a nice dinner in the visit area. You've got guests, have you? Yes, I have guests today. <laughs> so three tables, one is booked. <laughs> More than anyone, Matthew knows what it's like for Chan and Sukumaran to be staring down a death sentence. He was on one as well until commuted to life. There was a time when I was on the death penalty that I thought, what the fuck's the point? Then I realised that it doesn't matter what I do in here, it still affects my family. So I might as well be positive and healthy um, just for them because whatever I do affects them and it's surely fucked up so you trying to make the best of it for the family and stuff. But with a contribute fee of, of only you. Mayu and Andrew. I guess everyone's perspective of them back in Australia is what they've read through the media and all the tabloids. Um, they're nice people. So to me they're just, just friends. 32 or 33, yeah, something like that. You're standing in front in a very bureaucratic, organised system, and someone steps up and says, uh, and we're now going to kill you. How did you cope with that? It's made me look at it as a, hey, maybe one day I won't be able to get up. One day I won't, you know, one day I pro possibly won't have the chance to get up. So uh, it's put me on a different angle to look at things differently, to look at things differently. Probably to cherish life a lot more than what I did. So where are we up to? Going down to the church service. Yeah. Andrew has become a practicing Christian, but doesn't wish to talk about it. He knows many are cynical about prison yard conversions. Yeah, it brings me a fair bit of comfort and, uh, yeah. But much of his day is spent in prayer or religious study. Better in my mind. Makes me want to become a better person today and not tomorrow. I live every day as it comes. I live it though as my life. I'll make sure I've lived a good, good life. Shalom. That I'm happy with anyway, really. That's our English service, and generally I won. I run worship with Anwar right there, the, the guy that's singing here right there. It's an awesome weight. Do you consider this? Do you consider the death penalty that it, that it may be imposed on you? Yeah. Almost every night. It's, it's in the night time? Yeah. You're busy in the day? Yeah. Do you get to talk to anyone uh, about it? No. Andrew? 
he's in the same situation, but yeah, do you talk about it together? I don't talk about it. And when your family come to visit? No, I don't talk about it. For the past 18 months, Myran has thrown himself into creating activities and workshops at the prison. This is the art room. English classes, computer classes, and art sales that have funded, amongst other things, this screen print room. So obviously the prison can't afford to, uh, can't afford to give you this sort of stuff. You have to be very creative. You have to be very entrepreneurial. Yeah. With other prisoners, he set up a small business selling t-shirts and artwork. Maybe not everybody will buy a painting, yeah. but most likely everybody will buy a t-shirt for a souvenir. So you want to see some of the designs? Yeah, yeah. Remember that painting? Did you see it? Oh, in the gallery. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, oh, of course. Yeah. The clothing label, Kingpin, an ironic take on the tag he was given with devastating outcome by the Australian media. What's the brand? Uh, Kingpin or Kingpin Clothing. That's your, that's your name? Yeah. Right? That's what they call me, Kingpin. That's what you were called yeah. in the media too, yeah. right? Yeah. You were the kingpin. Yeah. And Andrew was the godfather and I was the kingpin. <laughs> it's pretty funny. At first they called me the enforcer. Right? Yeah, you were the tough one. You yeah, were the, the enforcer, martial, martial arts, arts expert. expert. Yeah. Yeah. I did three, three months of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu training and I became a martial arts expert. Yeah, yeah. Here I am living with my parents still. Like, just how many, how many godfathers do you know still live with their parents? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I probably had a few thousand dollars in savings and things. Um, had a car, had a bike. And that's about it, you know. I didn't have a house. Uh, I mean, a partly a, a partly flippant uh, question, but possibly a revealing one. What sort of car did you drive? Oh, <laughs> a 1991 Hyundai S Coupe. <laughs> so <laughs> it's almost like a Datsun 20B. Myran's family are visiting a gallery in Denpasar for an exhibition of prisoners' artwork. Is it to me? Yeah. Mm, very nice. And he even signed it. Including many from Myran. He used to draw when he was younger. Yeah? Yeah. It's the first time in a week that I've seen Myran's sister Brintha smile. This um, painting, um, Maya actually wanted to call it the Brady Bunch. That's Maya. That's me. Are you showing something to your family as well? Is that part of it? Yeah, trying to do stuff that they could be proud of. And are they proud of you? I hope so. It's the second day of the hearing, a day for expert witnesses to be called, and all eyes turn when the governor of the prison, Pax Aswanto, enters the court. Uh, I was very nervous when the governor of the prison came because I didn't really know what he was going to say. Kami memberikan tanggapan tentang dua terpidana mati. He spoke with a great deal of authority and just said it as he saw it. Yang bersangkutan selama berada di lembaga pemasyarakatan sudah menunjukkan perilaku yang baik. Jadi peran serta saudara Miuran ini sangat besar sekali di lapas dan pasar antara lain membantu program pembinaan dalam kursus bahasa Inggris bagi warga binaan pemasyarakatan di dan pasar dan juga kursus komputer. Dan menjahit juga dilaksanakan di sana dan ini ada peran serta saudara Meuran di tempat itu. Over 20 minutes, Pax Aswanto gives details of the programs that Myran and Andrew have been running. Ya, saya merasakan sebagai pimpinan lembaga pemasyarakatan sangat merasakan bahwa itu sangat besar sekali pengaruhnya. Tells how organizing those programs have improved them and more importantly given others a chance to follow the same path. Yang bersangkutan dijatuhi pidana mati. And then Saswanto offers a personal opinion, a stunning one for a government official. Kalau nanti pidana mati sampai dijatuhkan kepada yang bersangkutan kemudian sampai dieksekusi, bagi saya pribadi merasakan uh, kasihan. Kami secara pribadi 
kami tidak bisa melawan. Tapi secara secara naluriah ya, spiritual saya mengatakan apa tidak bisa diampuni? I would say that is unprecedented. I haven't seen that in any place in the world or even read about it. Apa pemerintah negara tidak bisa mengampuni? Makanya masalah hukum kami serahkan kepada bapak-bapak yang berkecimpung di dunia hukum. Tapi kalau masalah pembinaan saya ditanya bagaimana pendapat secara pribadi, saya menyatakan seperti itu. He's come in with the full authority of his office and said we have rehabilitated them. They want to be rehabilitated. It's been successful. Therefore, they should not be executed. And I'm the governor of the prison, and I know what I'm talking about. Aksuswanto may be a judge of character, but he's not a judge of the court. Their decision will be made in the months ahead, following a final hearing on Thursday. Those weeks and months are likely to be the longest in the lives of Andrew Chan and Myran Sukumaran. What hope? you have of what of your final chances yeah i hope to get a life sentence i hope not to be executed what sort of life would it be uh, for you um, it'll be a life better than no life yeah <laughs>